there are, you know, better armed terrorist organizations out there. Hezbollah, uh, probably better equipped, better, better missiles. Um, but, but, you know, Hamas are, are a force to be reckoned with in that they are a large organization. Um, they are extremely determined. But, but, you know, are they the best? Uh, are, are they a technical match for the Israeli Defence Forces? Absolutely not. Well, Major General Rupert Jones, thank you so much for joining us. I wanted to start by asking you about your own experience in the liberation of Mosul and, and how you think that might compare to the challenge that the Israeli forces are likely to face in what we believe is an imminent ground invasion of Gaza. Yeah, well, uh, hello, James. Very nice, nice to talk to you. So, yes, in 2016, 2017, I was the uh, deputy commander of the US-led coalition that helped support our Iraqi and Syrian partners as they defeated ISIS in the Middle East. Um, and, and a you know, really fundamental element of that campaign was liberating Mosul, um, a nine-month battle. Um, Mosul was, is Iraq's second city. Um, and so it was a really, really uh, big, big undertaking. And I think it gives us some, some real pointers. Differences too, but some real pointers as to what we might face, face in Gaza. And, and you know, just to give you a sense of it, you know, it took nine months for the Iraqi forces to liberate Mosul. Mosul is a city at the start of the battle. It had about one and three quarter million people. So, you know, not that dissimilar to the population of, of Gaza. Um, and the Iraqis amassed at the start of the operation about 100,000 troops for the, the start of that, that operation. So, you know, one of the themes for me that's really relevant here is fighting in cities as distinct from out in the desert or in the fields. Everything is magnified in a city. The amount of troops you need, sadly, the amount of casualties you're going to suffer. The level of civilian suffering goes up. The amount of ammunition you use scrutiny, international scrutiny goes up. The man is suffering. Everything is ratcheted up several several notches. So I think, you know, as we, as we begin to look at what, what um, may or may not happen in Gaza, I think Mosul gives a really good recent reference point. There are plenty of differences too. So in, in the case of Mosul, it was the Iraqis liberating their city. Yeah, they, they, there was a, the, you know, ISIS had taken it. They were taking it back, um, you know, so they were going in to liberate and then, you know, hold it. You know, this is different. Uh, the political dynamic in Gaza is very different. We don't know uh, what the Israelis' objectives are. We might come back to that, you know, so they go into Gaza for how long? What does it look like at the end of that? So there's lots of differences. But when you look about what it's going to feel like, for the Israeli defense forces fighting into that city. There's some really strong parallels that I think are, are helpful here. And reportedly, Hamas have built a series of tunnels in Gaza where they store weapons and to help them maneuver around the region. Was there anything similar in Mosul and what challenge would that pose to the Israelis? Yeah, I, I, I mean, of course, all cities are by their nature, thrown degree environments, aren't they? You know, they're high rise, their subterranean, their street level. And so all cities have that going on because they've got cellars, they've got sewers, you know. So, so there's always a, a subterranean element to any battle in a city. ISIS had been holding Mosul for an extended period of time and had absolutely prepared that, that city as a defensive bastion. And they'd, what I call, weaponized, weaponized the population, weaponized the city's resources, and they had they had built um, tunnels under under buildings, but not on the scale that that um, Hamas have seemingly done. Well, we know have done in in Gaza. This talk of you know several hundred miles of of tunnels. You know they're big. You know they can move big things big big things down. So ISIS hadn't gone to that degree, but they but the there were similarities. So what you would get is you get ISIS fighters in in one building. Uh, and they could then drop down out of that building, down into the, into the tunnel, and, and disappear, and then pop up somewhere else. So, so using that subterranean network is a real feature of of fighting in cities. Uh, and but but as I say, we know in in Gaza, it's taken to another to another level. And if you're the Israeli army trying to clear those tunnels or identify those tunnels in the first place, then clear them. Presumably, there are massive risks because they could be booby trapped. You you don't know what might await you. 
yeah, I mean, you know, we started to really come across this, you know, in, in the Vietnam War, you know, where the, where the US military were going into Viet Cong tunnels. I mean, a really brutal place to fight, particularly for the attacker, because it's, it's not your tunnel. You don't, you don't know the layout. You don't know what booby traps are down there. You know, it's, it's really at a, at a human level very frightening, very, very dangerous. Now, the Israelis have plenty of experience of this. They've been into the Gaza tunnels before. They found it a pretty unpleasant experience. But but we know that they have, the, the Israeli military are a fantastic learning organization. They're hugely innovative. Um, and we know that they've got, they've got specialist engineering units who are optimized to operate in those, in those tunnels. They've got all sorts of technology they, they can use in those, not least robots that can go in and, uh, and take the place of the human to, to some degree. Um, but it's a really, really hazardous in, in environment. And you've got to find the tunnels in, in the first place. And again, the Israelis have various techniques of trying to find these tunnels. Um, but, but yeah, so it's a really uh, knotty problem for them. What, what would be the technique? How do you find these tunnels? How do you identify them? Yeah, so, so um, you know, uh, th- there will be more to this than, than I'm going to tell you because the Israelis will have all sorts of techniques that, that they will keep a closely guarded secret. Um, but, but you could do things like um, if you're tracking a Hamas commander via his mobile phone or so, some other means of communication and then suddenly that means of communication disappears, um, He's either turned it off, or, or, but it's possible he's gone underground. So what does that tell you? And if you're mapping that over time, you can see a kind of patterns developing. OK, there appears to be something hap- happening there. And then that, that phone might pop up somewhere else. So there's, there's that sort of methodology. You can use things like, you know, ground penetrating radar. You know, there's all, you know, there's all sorts of routes. You know, there's, and then there's basic mapping. They'll have, in, they'll have intelligence dating back previously. So there'll be all sorts of techniques. But it is, of course, Im- imprecise. The Times is reporting that Hamas have received arms from North Korea. Uh, more generally, Rupert, how well armed do you think Hamas will be? Well, I mean, they're, they are they are well armed. Um, there are, you know, better armed terrorist organisations out there. Hezbollah, uh, probably better equipped, better, better missiles. Um but, but, you know, Hamas are, are a force to be reckoned with in that they are a large organization. Um, they are extremely determined. But, but you know, are they the best? Uh, are, are they a technical match for the Israeli Defense Forces? Absolutely not. Um, you know, and, and so discuss what happened at the hospital the other day. But, it, but you know, there are reports of a significant percentage of Hamas rockets never reach their destination because they are, you know, they're not, they're not reliable enough and they detonate somewhere in Gaza. Of course, that never really gets talked about, um, you know, the degree to which some of the destruction in Gaza is caused by, by Hamas. So, so they're no technical match for the Israelis. But one of the things that is, is always the case in fighting in cities is the defender has the advantage. So they may be outnumbered. They may not be as technically advanced. They may not be a professional fighting force in quite the same way as the Israelis are. But but a city defender has the advantage. They, they know the terrain. We've just talked about the tunnels, but it's their streets. It's their buildings. You know, they it's it. It's a it's a home match to use a sporting an analogy. And how does Hamas's weaponry compare to the Israelis? Hamas's weaponry is much more ad hoc, um, uh, and you know it's you know that we we believe that they're well well supported by uh, some organisations you mentioned North Korea, Iran uh, back them, but but the Israeli defence forces are. They're like no other military on earth, I would argue, because they're absolutely, you know, a first tier military. But unlike the American military, for sake of argument, ours, the French, they they have a singular purpose, which is the defense of Israel. Most other, you know, first tier militaries around the world have a multiple tasks you know they've got expeditionary capability they can find themselves fighting anywhere in the world the israelis are there about the defense of the homeland 
And so all of their doctrine, all of their equipment, their entire culture is is optimized around that. So, you know, they're all their armored vehicles, they're completely optimized for fighting in cities, for going into Gaza. So it's a, they're a very, very un, unusual uh, military from that point of view. It's very striking, Joe Biden speaking on US media earlier this week, saying that, that he supports Israel's plan to try and eliminate Hamas in Gaza. Do you think that is realistic? Do you think they have the firepower to do that, to remove Hamas from the equation? Yeah, I mean, I, I struggle with terms like eliminate. Um, and uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has used that, that, uh, that word as well, because, I mean, I understand why those words are used. They're, they're powerful, you know, and it, you know, it stirs up the imagination. But if you look at it from a, from a military point of view, eliminate means it kind of totally eradicate. So there's nothing left. That's very, very difficult to do, particularly in a city, because they can meld into the city, they can uh, hide in the civil population, they can just melt away. What is a much more realistic military objective, and I hope that this is what the Israeli general staff are talking about behind the scenes, is where you you destroy Hamas to such a degree that it is no longer an effective fighting force. And what I mean by that is that it's no longer able to achieve its military objectives and nor can it even consider the sort of attack it mounted in Israel uh, two Saturdays ago. And to do that, you know, there's a stack of things you have to do. You've got to kill as many of its leaders as possible. You've frankly got to kill as many of its fighters as, as possible. But you've also got to take down, if you like, the, the architecture that supports Hamas so that it's, it's weaponry, it's infrastructure, it's industrial base, you know, that's making the, these missiles. All of that is, I think, credible uh, as, as a military objective. One of your difficulties is knowing when is enough. You know, it's not like, you know, um, World War II battles of old, you know, where, where you, you know, you, you clear an objective and it's quite clear that enemy is defeated. You're in this huge built up area. You know, what point do you judge you have delivered what I've just described? You know, it, there's no absolutes here. Uh, and, and, and they're going to be under time pressure because... You know, firstly, the international community, you know, the scrutiny is going to be very, very significant. But also, you know, they're, they're, they're vulnerable. You know, they're, go back to my sporting analogy, they're playing an away match. You know, there's, there's an awful lot of pressure on them. Um, and that, that when they go, they'll want to go fast. And in terms of judging when it's mission accomplished, as it were, this is perhaps where the military objective ties in with the political objective, because, of course, Hamas are the, the governing body in Gaza. Would they judge it a success if it reaches the point where Hamas can no longer sustain itself in power? Yeah, and, and this is where, of course, you know, inevitably we're all we are all ultimately speculating um, because we hear the public pronouncements from Netanyahu and others. We're going to eliminate Hamas. What we don't know is what what are the real objectives. You know, we, when cool heads are sitting down in government government departments, and when the when the Israeli general staff are, are talking about their real war aims and indeed sharing with the likes of Prime Minister, uh, sorry, with President Biden, no doubt. What are, what are their real objectives? Uh, what does that really look like? That's that's very hard for us, us commentating to really get get behind the, the, the scenes of. And oh, by the way, when they have a, I mean, what's vitally important is that the Israeli government and the Israeli military have very clearly articulated objectives. They may they don't have to share them necessarily. Uh, I hope they will at some point, but they've got to be really clear about what their objectives are. Because if they go in with unclear objectives, and this becomes about, you know, dare I say it, retribution, um, th then then that's that's kind of that that's really dangerous. I suppose that brings us on to the humanitarian situation which there's been so much focus on this week. I'm guessing there's there's just no question that an operation like this is going to result in a significant number of civilian casualties, Rupert. Yeah, and, and the, the the great sadness is that when, when you fight in a city, civilians are going to suffer. Whether they're there or not, they're suffering. They've, they've left their homes before the battle uh, and their home gets destroyed or their 
home gets rampaged, or they stay and they and they're and they're a physical physical casualty. Civilians suffer in uh, in battles in in cities. There's no question about it. And of course, it is for this reason that the Israelis have encouraged the Palestinian population to move out of the northern area of of Gaza. Um, because you know they they want them out of the way because because it, it makes it very hard to fight when there's a, when there's a civilian population uh, there. Now, you know that, that and it's for that reason again that that um, uh, Hamas don't want them to move. You know because because they they make the Israelis' heart job much much harder. And you know, it's a, it's a it's a great tragedy that that civilians get killed in these sort in these sorts of battles, but we've got to be very careful of some of the very emotive language that, that that gets thrown around. So you know, people have used the term war crime very very readily. The only war crime I know of that's happened in the last ten days is what Hamas did to the Israeli population. I mean, no question that was murder on a on a diabolical scale. What we know the Israelis have done is prosecute a military campaign into Gaza to set the conditions for their land campaign. It is possible downstream it will be discovered that they've done things that sit outside the law of armed conflict. But but any speculation about that is, is merely speculation because regrettably civilians dying on the battlefield are not an indicator of a war crime. It, it is legitimate for civilians to get killed in these sorts of battles, so long as it is absolutely clear that the military target, or sorry, the target was military, and that sadly some civilians, you know, were 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 uh, were killed in the prosecution of that target. And the law of armed conflict is all about proportionality. So Israel has an absolute inherent right to self-defense, and self-defense in this instance is about taking the fight to Hamas and preventing Hamas attacking them again. It is as long as the amount of civilian, the, as long as the manner in which they they prosecute that aim is proportionate, and that is of course a judgment call, then then law, you know, then the law of armed conflict ha, has been upheld, and it's a very nuanced topic, and um, with the greatest respect. You know, that is not up for people like me as a commentator. It's not up for you as a journalist. It's not up for, you know, your average member of the public to make informed judgments about. We can all have a view, but just because we have a view, it doesn't mean it's a war crime or indeed not a war crime. It's a very nuanced conversation. And on the time scale of any operation in Gaza, what do you think we're looking at, Rupert? It was interesting you mentioned it took you nine months to liberate Mosul. What do you think the Israelis are looking at here? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, we sort of, the Israelis move very, very quickly. They mobilise their re- reserves, 360,000, incredibly quickly. I mean, hats off to them. I mean, that's a huge under- undertaking. And then then there's been this lull period, hasn't there, where, you know, they're, they are shaping into, into Gaza. They're killing uh, uh, Hamas leaders. They're taking down some of the infrastructure so that when they go in, it's as easy as it can be. I use the word easy in a very relative um, term. So when are they going to go in? You know, the military, you know, that it feels as though they're poised and ready now. Had they gone a week ago, they might not have been ready, but it feels as though they're kind of slightly chomping at the, at the bit now to go. As I say, their, their doctrine and indeed common sense says that when they go, they'll want to go in very fast, very hard. Uh, and and get momentum. Battles are all about momentum. They want to take the initiative and, and keep the initiative. Um, they know this city really well. You know they've fought in there previously, but they, if you know, I mean, they stare into this city the whole time. They'll have done any number of um, exercises. You know, rehearsing. You know what it feels like to go in into into Gaza. Um, but it's very difficult to predict timelines. It really is. You know, you can move through a city really quite quickly when you have momentum, when you have the initiative. But if Hamas managed to slow them down on an axis and grind them down, you know, you really can get ground to a halt. Because I said earlier that, that the defender has the, has the initiative. And what happens in a, in a city, the, the, every piece of concrete is an obstacle 
to the Israelis. You know, it's a physical obstacle, and it's also it's a potential fighting position for for Hamas. And also, the amount of detritus that exists in a city where war is happening. You know, there's destroyed cars, there's fallen down lamp posts, there's buildings that are collapsed into the road. Just moving your vehicles, you know, your your high tech equipment through a city is incredibly difficult. And so, you know, if, if your access, your route, your road that you're you're using is open and clear, and you can keep momentum, you can move you can quite move quite quickly and seize the objective. It might be a roundabout or something you're you're trying to, that you feel is important. But but if your if your route gets blocked because the road's cratered either you know, through previous fighting or because the enemy has created it. You know, the, 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 the advance can slow down very, very quickly. And this is what we saw in Mosul, the bits of the city, you know, the Iraqis would cut through really quite quickly and make quick gains. And then other bits of the city, they, they'd be stopped in their tracks, they'd lose momentum. And it would become almost like a kind of World War I battlefield, but in a city, you know, with lots of, you know, munitions being fired back and forth until you could unlock that bit of the defence and go again. Obviously, President Biden has been in Israel this week, also Rishi Sunak. Just from a political leadership point of view, it's it's notable that we have a new Defence Secretary now in Grant Shapps who doesn't have any personal military experience. He succeeds Ben Wallace, who was very highly respected, it seems, by, by many in the military community. How big a test will this be, would you say, for Grant Shapps? And, and is he the right man to lead... Britain through this moment? Uh, well, I mean, clearly not for me to judge ultimately. Um, and, uh, and Prime Minister Sunak is leading Britain through through the moment. And for one, I can see, you know, d- doing a, g- a good job. I might make one caveat on that in, in just a moment. So, so look, Grant Shapps is Defence Secretary. I- I'm, a, I'm a great believer that, that firstly, UK defence, the military, must work with whoever the nominated Defence Secretary is. Frankly, it's therefore slightly academic. The military must get on and work with that that defence secretaries, um, and 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 that's you know that's how it works in, in a democracy. I would also say I'd much for the right man who has no military background than the wrong man or woman who does have a military background. Sure, Ben Wallace was was in the Scots Guards once upon a time. With a very great respect to Ben Wallace, he was in the military a very long time ago. I'm sure he's a great politician. And he is a little bit empathetic to what it's like to serve in uniform. But to me, we've had a great many very, very affected defence secretaries who have not been uh, in uniform. And if I'm brutally honest, I think there are plenty of things that we can look back and go that Ben Wallace might have done better. Um, You know, ultimately, has he secured a really substantial increase in the defence budget in the way that some of his colleagues have in Europe through... You know the Ukraine period? No, not really. Um, so you know, I, I, there, there are two sides to the conversation about uh, about Ben Wallace, and that's not really the, the, this conversation. But I just want to come back to, to uh, Sunak because Sunak used one word that I would I would take issue with. You know, he talked about um, in uh, his I, I forget when when but when he when he was out in, in the Middle East, he talked about uh, in, you know, wishing Israel luck in winning. Winning is a really emotive word, and and I would argue unhelpful. Um, I think it's particularly unhelpful in this instance because what's going on in the Middle East, you know, engenders such emotions. This is about Israel uh, carrying out its right of self-defense. It's responding to what Hamas did, and it and needs clear objectives. This isn't about winning or losing. It is about achieving your political and your military objectives. But but I think a word like winning, you know, you, you won the Falklands War. You won the Second World War. Even in Ukraine, it's not really about winning. It's about it's about restoring uh, Ukrainian sovereign territory. So I just think we've got to be really careful with, with, with our language because it can take us down unhelpful rabbit holes. And it's, it's notable, Rupert, that you mentioned the constraints on the UK defence budget. Are we in any position, given our commitments to Ukraine as well, to uh, to fund military support for Israel? Well, you know, so President Biden, you know, has made an address to the American people, hasn't he, uh, yesterday on return from the Middle East, pushing for, uh, I think it's 100 billion 
uh, from memory, it was 60 billion for you, another 60 billion for Ukraine, 10 for is Israel, and I think, you know, some for Taiwan uh, and the like. And, you know, I think you made a very compelling narrative about the degree to which, you know, democracies are, are being are being threatened. Um, I, I, you know, UK has an important role to play globally. It's demonstrated that in Ukraine. It's why, you know, Sunak went in, into the Middle East. We have keen interests in, into the Middle East. And I, and I hope very much that the UK government will provide support to Israel's military where Israel need it. But I also hope, that, as I'm sure they are, will provide support on the humanitarian side. Again, that's an important role that the United Kingdom plays. And then, you know, the other thing the United Kingdom will be doing will, will be protecting its own interests. And, you know, we know that a couple of Royal Fleet auxiliaries are uh, in or moving to, to the region. But typically, the UK will also then look at um, what are the consequences of this conflict on UK interests? So we have a sovereign base in, in Cyprus. We have we have uh, strong interests in that region. There's you know, we've got a, a big UK diaspora in, in the region. So the UK defence will be looking at how are our interests threatened and how, you know, what, what do we need to do to make sure that if there's any kind of escalation in the conflict, UK interests are protected. And just finally, Rupert, there has been so much talk about Gaza and Israel over the past fortnight, understandably. Is there anything that you think hasn't been discussed enough that you think people should be talking about? I, I mean, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think, you know, I think um, this this problem has been, you know, dissected from every possible angle. I don't think it's about what's being discussed. I think it's the manner in which it's being discussed. You know, I think you have to go to quite um, specialised um, media outlets to find a really balanced conversation. It's so complex. We know the Middle East. You know, if 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 this was easy, you know, any number of peace, um, Middle East peace processes would have reaped greater di dividends. This is monumentally complicated. It's diabolical for the Palestinians. It's diabolical for the the Israelis. And it, I suppose the only thing I I you know it's a, a forlorn hope is is I wish people could. <clears throat> I always say in the military, you try and view a problem from the other person's trench. What's it, you know, too many people, I think, look at this problem. You know, I'm pro-Palestinian or I'm pro-Israeli. I don't think that helps. If you're an Israeli, be pro-Israeli. If you're a Palestinian, yeah, you're... Be, but, but just try and take the sting out of it. Try and take the emotion out of it. Uh, because that's the only way anything positive can come out of this awful period that we've seen over the last fortnight where perhaps... The, the whole peace process, once, once the, the dust settles, the whole peace process can perhaps get a, get a new uh, lease of life. And I suppose, you know, the final thing I would say is, you know, we're very focused on Gaza, uh, you know, and we've just got to hope that cool heads prevail and there isn't a spread in the conflict, you know, with Lebanese Hezbollah uh, intervening, with um, uh, escalation in, into the, the West Bank, that would be that would be it's just it's bad for everybody. You know, there's a lot of emotion here, and 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 I'm quite certain on on diplomatic back channels, there's an awful lot of conversations going on just to try and make sure that this conflict doesn't spread. Major General Rupert Jones, thank you so much for joining us.